it's time for another episode of Stick a Fork in It. And I mentioned today the little podcast that could. Right? right. That's right. We have our teammates on with us, uh, amazing lady that have ladies that have launched the nutrition education program. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's such an important part of what we do that I think probably isn't thought about too often. You know, we do get a lot of food in, we get it out to the community, but what we're giving out and what people can do with it is is such an important factor. And teaching people how to be healthy about food is just as much a part of food banking as giving them food. Right. And healthy for them. And I think another little nugget, and then you guys got to listen or watch, is the strategically placed food in our pantries and how they do that to make sure you eat well, but also can have a little something, something snack too and be right on track with your nutrition. So we're not going to make you wait another minute for Kelly and Sam. All right. Kelly, welcome back to Stick a Fork in It. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. For I think you've been me. on a few times. A couple of times. It feels like forever ago, though. And Sam, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So we're going to start. We're going to dive in to get to know. We're going to remind people who Kelly is. And maybe she's <laughs> going to share a few things that we didn't know already. And then Sam will give you a shot to let us know all about you. In the beginning here, we're just wanting to get to know you personally. So talk to me, Brickfield. I'm <laughs> <laughs> back, uh, back in softball practice and being called by my last name. <laughs> there you go. Because that's kind of like what our work is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. <laughs> out, in the, out in the weather and the heat. Um, so tell us a little bit about you mm -hmm. personally and then – I want to know a little bit about you professionally, like what brought you to Feeding Tampa Bay? Okay. Um, so personally, I am the mother of three adult children. Still don't know how that happened, considering I still feel like I'm 25 inside. So um, anyway, um, I have one granddaughter who's the light of my life. Um, she's an absolute blast. We're having tons of fun. She'll be two at the end of December. Um, so that's pretty much how I spend weekends. Anytime we can get time with her is, uh, is, is good time. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty much, you know, the personal side. Um, as for work, um, Prior to joining Feeding Tampa Bay, I worked for Weight Watchers for a little over 20 years. Wow. Um, yeah, I was a meeting leader. At one point, I was a full-time meeting leader. I think I had up to about 17 different meetings a week. Um, and then I kind of shifted towards supporting the corporate office and in internal communications, which was in some ways really great because I did that from home, um, but always hung on to um, a handful of meetings because that's kind of like we do here, right? That's what keeps you grounded in the mission. Um, and, you know, some structure was changing in the corporate office and things were sort of shifting on that side of my world. And it um, got to the point where I needed to start looking for something else. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of looking for all sorts of opportunities. And uh, my husband actually came home one day. He was on um, Matt Spence's programs board committee. And he came home and said, hey, I heard about this job today and I think you'd be great at it. Here's the, um, you know, here's the guy's email, email him and whatever. And so long story short, <laughs> um, that was the job I got hired into at the end of 2019. Um, basically to bring our food prescription programs to life, um, which was great. Got a little delayed for COVID as the world did. Um, and then, you know, we started expanding into other programs. Um, the Bay Care Hospital Healing Bag Project that we have, where we give out bags of shelf-stable food to um, food and secure patients when they're being discharged. Um, I also oversee our mobile grocery store, which stocks the same level of healthy foods. Um, and then, you know, Nutrition Ed came on board. Um, the really cool thing for me when coming on board from Weight Watchers, I had a few friends that called out the irony of 
oh, you're over here working for Weight Watchers telling people not to eat, and now you're over here telling people here's what you need to eat. Um, and it really wasn't ever that. But I saw so many people in my career um, at Weight Watchers start eating healthier and improve their health outcomes. You know, it was a, it was a routine occurrence when I would hear um, oh my gosh, I've changed the way I'm eating and my A1C dropped, I'm, you know, my blood pressure is better, you know, all of these health markers. Um, so it was really neat for me to be able to hopefully bring that experience mm -hmm. to the folks that we serve through Feed in Tampa Bay who likely aren't in the position to be able to afford memberships to programs like that, maybe can't afford to purchase some of those healthier foods on their own. So just being able to provide that food for folks and have them experience that same benefit in their health, um, that's been worth all the tea in China. That's awesome. I love the transition from Weight Watchers. And I mean, I I think many of us are familiar with Weight Watchers and it has, I, I know it limits, but also, again, like you said, uh, totally supports that healthy approach to eating, diet, exercise, all of the things. So very cool. You landed and transitioned into a perfect place. And I'm so thrilled personally <laughs> <laughs> to have been with you as well. I think we, I, we, I came on a little bit before you did. Uh, with the merger in 2019. So we've kind of are that starter group from 2019. So Sam, tell us about you, girl. You've been sitting there so quietly. What's going on? With, first of all, who are you? I'm Samantha. I am the assistant director of nutrition education over here at Feeding Tampa Bay. I have been here about nine months now, coming up on my one year anniversary, which is crazy because it feels like I was just hired yesterday. So I don't know where all that time went. Um, personally, I am originally from New Hampshire, but I've been in Tampa about, I think I just had my, my nine year anniversary in Tampa too. Um, and I recently moved to the Seminole Heights area. I had lived there previously, moved away, and now I'm back. And I'm very excited because I am right on the river. Um, so I've been spending a lot of my days picking fruit from the fruit trees in the yard and actually have a friend um, who is looking into buying. So I live on the property. There's two houses. My friend lives in one. I live in the other. And we have a friend who is in the middle of purchasing us a Highlands cow for the property. So I ne will now be a Highlands cow taker. If all Oh, I can't wait to meet it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so we're very excited. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I will be taking on the responsibility of additionally being a cow caretaker. Um, so <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's pretty much me when I'm doing nutrition stuff, um, doing those type of things. I also play video. I love video games. So that's something I do in my spare time. Oh, you and Ev got it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ed, what's your favorite video game right now? Oh, man, that's impossible. <laughs> uh, I, I'm playing a really niche one called Disco Elysium. <laughs> now, let me ask you: Is it like for me? I got to read one book at a time, do, or do you do you play one at a time and master it, or do you play a bunch of them? Depends mm. on how many things are out at the moment for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> yeah, it kind of depends on how. I think it depends on how my life's going, and like some. Some games I can play at the same time. Like, I'll pick up Animal Crossing, for instance, and I'll play <laughs> and all that. And then, you know, I might pick up Stardew Valley, and, like, those are two games I can play at the same time. But some of them, where they're more, like, action involved, I can mm -hmm. play at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, what brought, what did you do before feeding Tampa Bay? What is your main focus for your career so far? So I'm a dietitian by trade, I guess you would say. So um, I have a bachelor's in nutrition, and that's from the University of New Hampshire. And then I moved down here, and I did a uh, combined master's of health and dietetic internship at the University of South Carolina. So I was becoming a dietitian, and there were, kind of, there were two things that it, one, food insecure populations, and the other was, um, like, pediatric nutrition mm -hmm. it's so 
right before I had taken my state exam to become a dietitian, I actually I actually reached out to Thomas at the time um, because I had interned here during my internship. Like, I think you guys need to take it. You want to stop that time because I can stop that. That's uh, very uh, And he, he was so great in his response and obviously said, you know, we're not big enough. At that time, Feeding Tampa Bay wasn't big enough. It was like right before Feeding Tampa Bay got really big, but like stay in touch, get the yada. yada. Um, so, I passed my state exam and I was hired the same day by Tampa General Hospital. And I did a maternal ward for a little bit, but then transitioned over to the neonatal ICU. So I got that part of my interest. Um, and when I was doing that, I kind of started diving into nutrition on a little bit of a deeper level in learning about like intuitive eating and health at every size and more um, positive beneficial beneficial nutrition nutrition messaging when it comes to food um and about how you know a lot of what the nutrition messaging is in this country is focused on restriction and kind of unhealthy dieting so because I was really interested in that, I started my own business, a girl I went to grad school with, um, and did that for a couple of years. And then um, it wasn't, I loved it, but I wasn't reaching the population that I felt like needed that messaging the most, right? Um, it was a private pra- practice business, and I had to charge a certain amount of money, and I kept running into people that needed what I could provide in that nutrition education but I wasn't able to provide it on a, uh, I guess you could say, like, scale that would help those people the most. So that brought me to uh, LinkedIn, where I was trying to, like, connect the different pieces, you know, of, like, project management, nutrition education, um, really, like, like, being great at analytical type stuff and landed on this job. And I have here today. So that's how I got here. It's really exciting. Um, I'm happy to be here for sure. So how did, Kelly, let me ask you, how did the nutrition education program begin? Was it something when, that that was created as we grew? Because like Samantha said, at a point in time, we were too small to support something like that. I mean, this is a big undertaking. There's a lot of moving parts. Yeah to cover our counties. Can you briefly explain to that and how it's made possible? Yeah, sure. So um, as a Feeding America Food Bank in the state of Florida, we have um, a kind of state advocacy agency, and if I'm saying that wrong, correct me, um, in Feeding Florida. So um, they basically look for opportunities um, and advocate for all of the food banks within the state of Florida. So they were approached about applying for, um, it's basically a USDA grant administered in Florida through the Department of Children and Families um, that facilitates, um, basically it's, technically it's a SNAP education program. So um, our nutrition ed is targeted for SNAP eligible families. And for those who don't know what SNAP is, it's, you know, formerly known as food stamps. Um, so SNAP is, um, is now what it's called. So um, we spent about a year working on with all of the other food banks in the state of Florida and Feeding Florida, putting together proposals and budgets. And um, it was painful at times. <laughs> um, sure. But um Anyway, you know, long story short is um, we got a very large portion of the grant. Um, we are we are responsible for adult new adult SNAP ed in all 67 of the Florida counties. So um, for Feeding Tampa Bay, that means we're responsible for adults in all 10 of our counties. Um, and then as a network, we I don't know the exact breakdown, but I say maybe half of the school age kids throughout our network. So um, we, Sam, I always forget if it's six and four or five and five, (laughs) Um, but we have school age kids in a portion of our counties as well. Um, So it's a hundred percent grant funded. So once we got the green light on that, um, we went about hiring and I think we brought 
11 people on board the last week of November last year. Okay. It was um it was it was kind of a blast. It was it, it was people thought I was nuts, but I'm like no, I think we brought like nine people on board on Monday and then two more on um on that Wednesday and we reserved the you know Fresh Force conference room and just did a full on immersion that first week. Um, and wow. then our nutrition educators got up and running, I think, starting in March. And um, they've been out there killing it and growing ever since. So it's been a blast. That, that's incredible. Um, nutrition education is so important, especially from, and really quickly, I'm going to tell a personal experience. One of my sons, I'm a mom of three sons as well, but one of my sons, and if you have more than one, you know, hormonally, their bodies change quite a bit. And he was about 10 years old and he went from being underweight and we're worried about what he's eating to really hormones hit and he went boom, you know, really, really quickly. Um, he had a actual pediatrician shame him um, into uh, how he needed to cut back. And I'm standing there. And of course, this is before I was part of hunger relief or addressing nutrition or anything like that. And I literally grabbed my child's hand and I walked out the door. And that's why when you mentioned to me in my heart and anybody who's listening, how important nutrition education is, all of our bodies are different, They'll, especially in children, especially in children, because their hormones, everything changes. Heck, when you're an old lady like me, your hormones <laughs> change and things change. You know what I mean? So Preach this, that's, <laughs> that's why I'm so interested in nutrition education and how we're approaching it. So, Sam, can you tell me a little bit about what that experience is for people when they are meeting with one of our educators? Yeah. So one of the big focuses that I kind of honed in on before the educators went out and taught their education classes was kind of a background into the history of, you know, BMI and food restriction, body shaming, um, and the impacts that they can have on people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is kind of unique uh, to this food bank because that is uh, an approach that I've learned over time when you go to school to be a dietitian. That's not necessarily the approach that is learned. It's kind of something that I've um, developed and working with a bunch of different people from different backgrounds and groups over time. Um, so they've had training by me on how the messaging that you provide when you're talking nutrition matters so, so much and probably exponentially more when you're talking to people who are worried where their next meal is going to come from. Um, because just one single comment can be so impactful to mm -hmm. anyone. And when you have a thousand other things that you're stressed about, it puts you even more at risk to develop an unhealthy relationship with food in your body. And once that happens, it's really hard to kind of shed that stigma of, you know, I'm, I'm bad for my food choices. I'm bad for this my body and so all of the educators are well versed in that and even though they have that curriculum they have to follow because as kelly said it's it's a usda grant um coming down through dcf there are set curriculums but there is flexibility in kind of the way those messages are presented and so every single one of them is out there presenting nutrition messaging in a um, what I would like to call like non-harmful way, a human first approach that's mm -hmm. going to be more beneficial than harmful. When she mentioned health at every size in our interview, I'm like, yeah, she's the one. Yeah, yep. she's it. Yep. it it's yep. kind of that it's, it's our culture, that yep. respectful, dignified, thoughtful approach because every yep. individual is different. You have no idea what they're going through. You know, when you talk about shaming and of course I talked about my son being heavy at a time, but there are people that are shamed because they're not, they're skinny. I mean, or, you know, there's all kinds of ways, but what I think is unique about feeding Tampa Bay and Kelly, I know with working with feeding Florida and our other food banks and really for all of us, our culture is that approach, right? That thoughtful individual approach to lift people towards stability rather than shame them into it. Or, you know, it's just like, we can all do this together. And that's, 
first of all, I love what Sam's approach and what she's saying and really who you have been through your career, right, Sam, from even being an intern at Feeding Tampa Bay. And now you're helping mold other educators to approach in the same way. So right now, Kelly, how many counties are we in and how are those trainers distributed? I know it's not like one person per county. It really depends on the population, right? Yep. Yeah. So we, um, thankfully, we actually have a presence in all 10 of our counties, which is um, super exciting because like, as you know, with some of our you know, smaller micro-focused programming, it's it's harder to get out into yes. some of those outer counties. So um, that's one of the things I think I'm most proud of. Um, but yeah, so we have um, our nutrition educator, Chris, shout out to Chris, is up. Um, she lives on the Hernando Citrus border. So she covers Hernando Citrus and Sumter counties. Um, and then Lauren is in Pasco County. Um, Jonna covers Pinellas. Aubrey is down in Manatee. She is out on parental leave right now with her brand new beautiful baby. So um, we'll have to make her listen. Um, And then in Hillsborough County, because of the population, we have three educators based here in Hillsborough. So um, we have Tiffany and Yadney and Brenda here in Hillsborough. And then Karen is out in Polk and um, Michelle covers Hardy and Highlands. Um, And the thing we like about it is that the, the folks, our educators are out there covering areas that they live in and they know. Yes. Um, so, you know, they're, they're talking to their neighbors and they're talking to people who, um, you know, who they can relate to. Um, so it's, um, I love the fact that they're embedded into their, you know, coverage territory, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they're taking advantage of connections they already had, plus branching out um, and, you know, kind of uh, just making that network even bigger. So it, it's really a, a neighbor situation down to the core of it all and being able to kind of share that message of uh, pr- how you approach eating and taking care of yourself. Um, Sam, any reflection stories? Have any of your team members shared a, a, a special story that is directly reflected on the program so far? Yeah, so I, I can think of, they share them and we have a nutrition group chat and there's been a bunch, but one of the most recent ones is Tiffany, who is one of the Hillsboro educators. She's been doing a lot of youth classes because Hillsboro is one of the, uh, the counties that we do cover youth in. And um, she most of the classes will include a recipe and then that the educator will prepare and then distribute to the kids or the adults, whatever the class is targeting. Um, Tiffany made fruit pizza the, the other day and a lot of the kids in the class are like, well, she was like putting them together. That's so gross. I'm never going to eat that, you know, and right? then she takes them, assembles them all pretty. And I think, I think that she put in the group chat that all the kids tried them after and they were like, Miss Tiffany, this slapped and just ended up like <laughs> flopping them. So with and I, there's been a bunch of those. They've happened in adult classes too, where like the educators will teach them a recipe, and then for series based classes, you know, they occur over multiple weeks. So participants will then come back and like tell them, "Oh, I tried the recipe you gave us. Like it was so good." And I think that's one of the best things because that shows that there's learning going on, and they're teaching them something that they didn't think of before that might be like something that we think of like right off right off the bat Uh, but but I have a bunch of those but Tiffany's just the the most recent one and that's a very very um, heartwarming and yeah well I need I need the recipe for fruit pizza now because that actually sounds really good and Ev come on man (laughs) anything that's pizza with Ev Um, I don't want to get a Bible debate. It, it goes on pizza. so <laughs> Right? You can make it work on pizza. Um, Ev, do you have any questions? Well, no questions, but, you know, I, my team, uh, the content team does, has actually started working more closely with nutrition education to create some recipes for folks. And I think that's something that I've always really thought was really cool. I mean, we started doing it even before the team before, but trying to teach people how to use the food that we have, which is kind of so crucial because – at a food bank, we don't really put in an order for what kind of food we get. We just get what we get from farmers and from grocery partners. Mm-hmm. And so, 
you know, we get lots of people who don't know what to do with a butternut squash or an acorn squash or, you know, um, uh, five cans of chickpeas. So, like, I, what, what, how do I eat this? <laughs> right. so, um, you know, how do I get creative with five cans of chickpeas, which yeah. is one of the first <laughs> things I learned when I came to feeding Tampa Bay. There's a lot of ways. <laughs> right? There is a lot of different recipes that can happen with that. Um, I know in a lot of our programs, we hone in on cultural uh, foods and experiences. Does the nutrition education team do that too? Like if you're in a certain, you know, Hispanic community, do you guys do that as well? Absolutely. Yes, they do. So there's, I guess there's a couple parts to that. So how Kelly said that the, each of the educators are in the counties that they live in. That has been crucial to a lot of them because, you know, some of those counties are more, and even within the county, different sections are more, uh, they might be one culture versus just like down the road, there's another culture too. And we try as much as possible to um, be respectful of that. And the educators are really good at it and picking their lessons and also picking the recipes. So they have a big bank of recipes that they can pick from. Um, and if they're like teaching at a mainly Hispanic site, they'll choose a recipe that will be, you know, feel culturally appropriate to someone in the culture that they're they're teaching a class in. Um, so they're great at that. They have free reign on picking their recipes. Sometimes we'll get ideas in the chat from others that have taught in like similar areas or have had exper more experience than others. Um, and they bounce ideas off each other that way too, but absolutely. And two of our educators speak Spanish, so they could get out and do, um, do the classes in Spanish for, you know, communities that, um, you know, the folks are, you know, maybe speak English, but Spanish is their preferred first language. So mm -hmm. we can get out and do them in Spanish as well. So that's been, I think, really helpful in keeping things culturally appropriate. I think um, as an organization between how translating our website in such a magnificent way to now we have uh, Lorena Hardwick on who uh, speaks Spanish that we can get out in the news to all of our networks. You know, we really do try hard to think very thoughtful about a culture. But I know with Ev working on the recipes, we also want to introduce, like you mentioned, the butternut squash, like open their mind to try something new, but also give that dignity and respect back to that. Those two words again that honoring your culture and what you're used to and make providing that for you and healthy alternatives, right? Mm -hmm. So Kelly, um, before we close, and then we're gonna ask a couple personal questions and, and we're gonna yeah. alter them a bit from a normal show, but what is the future of the nutrition education program? What do you see happening? Um, well, I, of course, you know, it's so the, the grant that we, um, that we started the program under is a three-year grant. We obviously fully expect for that to continue to be renewed and renewed and renewed. Um, I would like to get, you know, more of our population, like we would love to be able to serve the, um, you know, school-age kids in all 10 of our counties and not just a handful. Um, so, so yeah, um, as far as that goes, I expect that to continue. Um, mm -hmm. There's a second side of nutrition ed that we haven't really touched on yet, which is um, policy systems and environmental change work. So PSE for short. Um, so RJ on our team who came to us from the child hunger team um, is leading that effort. And that's where, you know, we go out um, either within our own food bank or to agency partners, um, school partners, healthcare partners, and just try to help enact, as, it, as it's titled, policy systems or environmental changes that can just help people make the healthier choice the easy choice, right? So, whether it's just, you know, shuffling things around in a client choice pantry so that the healthier foods are the foods that you see first, um, you know, not taking any of the other choices out of the equation, um, but just making the healthier foods more prominent, providing recipe cards and nudges so that when people see the buttered up squash, they don't just walk by. Maybe they'll pick up that little recipe card yeah. and say, oh, wow, that looks really good. Maybe I'll try that. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's truly what it's all about. So when you talk about nutrition education, um, you know, it, it just it kind of blows my mind how many folks can reach adulthood and really just not um, through no fault of their own, but really just not have a good understanding of nutrition. And so I think the way that we're 
um, you know, presenting it to the community and under Sam's guidance, she's done an amazing job. Um, you know, it's just, it's non-threatening. It's very, you know, open and welcoming and really just helps people understand, like, you know, there's a lot out there beyond, you know, just, um, you know, I think sometimes people think healthy food and they think, oh, you know, granola bar, chicken breast, broccoli, brown rice. Ugh, I can't eat that for my whole life. Right. And you just don't realize how much bigger the world is beyond um, just basic things like that. So um, that's like, one of the things. I'm like free about. pizza. Yeah. I'm yeah, going right. to the free pizza. So <laughs> I, this brings up a question. Like I always right? if I tease around about pop tarts, I really do. I tease. <laughs> Um, I don't eat them as much as it, it sounds like I eat them. I just think toasted perfectly. They're just delicious. But mm -hmm. my flavor, question flavor, is flavor. from a, I'm sorry. Favorite flavor. Cherry. Oh, Cherry. Well, second brown sugar. I've got them both on deck. Frosted strawberry for me. That's childhood memories 101. <laughs> that is my middle son's. He always has that in his cabinet. Strawberry pop tarts, well, frosted, of course. All right, Sam, do you have a favorite pop tart flavor? Um, mine's brown sugar and strawberry. Not <sighs> that, like the the OG pop tarts. I grew up on them, so I'm like, <laughs> like about like the Eggos. Nothing beats. Oh. oh, and let's get crazy on the toaster strudel. Don't even oh, get me started. Oh, I don't yeah. even buy them. I don't <laughs> buy them. No, I, they yeah. don't need to be here. Ev, what is your favorite pop tart? Morris. Oh, oh, he, he dies head down like yeah. all in. my daughter <laughs> my daughter was all into the s'mores during high school <laughs> so Sam, Sam my question is for you there's fun foods right yeah and I know this is that everybody is an individual and you really have to look at it that way yeah. but that overall vision because you know we have a ton of healthy foods in all of our pantries all of our distributions but every once in a while like I've said it's what comes in and we definitely get it right back out there. So sometimes it might be something fun. Um, that's not necessarily nutritionally beneficial for us. What is, when, when should we indulge in that? You know, uh, personal trainers say you should have a cheat day. Um, what, what is the balance? And I know that might be a hard question and you're allowed to tell me, Shannon, that's it's everybody for themselves, but how do we balance? Every man for itself. No. Yes. Um, it is a hard question to answer because it is a really personal thing. But, you know, for us as a food bank, we're not out there offering personal nutrition counseling. So it is a question that does need some direction. Um, I, w I always like to answer with this. No matter what food you are eating, it is providing you with some nutritional benefit. Even like a lollipop is a is carbohydrate and that is fuel for your brain. Everything you eat that is a food is giving your body some sort of fuel. Some foods are more nutritionally dense than others. When foods are more nutritionally dense than others, they offer more benefits to our body. Think like antioxidants and fruits, antioxidants and vegetables, fiber and whole grains, that type of thing. Um, and then I'll always like to say that having being fed and having like a fuller stomach is going to be better than um, going hungry and eating, you know, something like not avoiding something that's less nutritionally dense because you're trying to be healthy because overall not eating is the unhealthiest thing. Right. Um, which is why, you know, I love working at a food bank so much because we provide food to people to try to keep them healthy. <laughs> um, right. But the question, but the, question as to like how often you should eat less nutritionally dense food really varies person to person i would like i approach it from like how can i eat how can i add more nutrients to what i'm already eating and then fill in the gaps with less nutrition oh nutrition i like that when you have to. so it's kind of like if you've eaten your balanced meals and you've done really well on eating fresh and low sodium. I know also for a lot of those in our care, uh, drinking plenty of water, you know, and not necessarily sugary drinks or whatever. Uh, then you can kind of approach that and just go down on that, like eat that pop tart. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we did all the pop tart talk. We all love the pop tarts. <laughs> Sam, what is your go-to craving right now? Okay. So, 
Halloween season's coming up. I'm looking forward to cooler weather, which here in Florida doesn't really happen by Halloween, but you know, wishful thinking. Um, but Halloween season rolls out the Oreos that are orange in the middle. And though they don't have a specific flavor, there is just something about the orange filling of the Oreos that I gravitate towards. So I'm- It resonates with you. I love it. <laughs> Cause I was gonna say, don't they taste the same? Like- and then the- the deck the like pumpkins like carved into the chocolate cookie it's just like a whole different experience so i'm really looking forward to those right now i'm waiting till they hit the shelves that's my oh i saw them yesterday did you oh no you know it rolls out with the pumpkin spice yeah i'm so sorry had i known they were your favorite i would have wrapped a pack for you (laughs) now we know now we all know she's probably gonna have a stack of of uh pumpkin oreos on her desk she's gonna come in with like multiple packs of oreos yes yes i'm gonna be at the public spogo and be like oh god i gotta get this for sam (laughs) but yeah so they're my go-to right now or they're about to be okay that's amazing so kelly what's yours um well kind of two actually so um on the on the like meal side, um, I've been really into just experimenting with different types of seafood. Um, as um, someone who grew up in New England, like Sam, um, you know, I grew up in with clams and lobster and you know shellfish basically, um, and I've never been like super great at just fish fish. Um, so you know, when we go out to dinner, I'm trying to like you know. I'll order like a, um, I don't know, like a flounder piccata or something, and then um, try to replicate it at home. Nice. Um, so I've been doing stuff like that. Um, my husband would eat red meat every day of the week if I let him. So, you know, I'm trying to find some, um, uh, you know, some options that aren't red meat every day of the week that he also likes. So there's that. As far as indulgent treats, um, I am not at all a pumpkin spice person. Um, Amen. I, I don't get it, but go ahead. No, very much a peppermint mocha person. Oh, so I look forward to because that comes right on the heels of um, of pumpkin spice. Sometimes there's a little overlap in there, yep. so I yeah look forward to that. Um, All a new thing, thing is the maple mocha. Oh. Yeah, like maple know. coffees, maple. I, I prefer that over pumpkin spice any day if you're going to talk fall. Ev, what about you? What's your go-to? I We already know pizza and mac and cheese, but do you have like a certain something right now that you're like, dang, I can't wait to have that? Um, Man, pretty much just my favorite spot. It's always the same place in, uh, in St. Petersburg. There's a, a Thai Mex fusion restaurant called Natalie's that is like, I should basically be like sponsored by them at this point. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. And now maybe because you're talking about them on the podcast, you might get get a, get a little get a little meal no. out of it. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I so we all need to try meals. that or hanging out in St. Pete. <laughs> you know, I'm really thankful for you guys to join us today. It's always so fun uh, during Hunger Action Month and into uh, the fall and winter season. We're going to be really celebrating work that Feeding Tampa Bay does, but that also resonates, like you said. Um, Kelly, throughout our other food banks, just under Feeding Florida, throughout our state, and then throughout our country, um, we all kind of have this mindset of dignity, respect, health, nutrition, and stability, right? Um, Really stopping hunger. Um, And it just begins with that whole food. And on our out, I'm into peaches and soft serve ice cream. Mm. Fresh peaches, my healthy thing, Sam, it's my healthy I love that. Oh, but a cone from a twisty tree. Here, here's a here's a twist on that for you. We had dinner with friends um, at their house a couple of weeks ago, and my friend Laura grilled peaches. That's amazing. and then the vanilla ice cream. Just oh, and now I can have them all together in one big bowl. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, putting it out there. <laughs> oh, Jay's gonna spark the grill up because he's gonna be grilling some peaches. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that sounds delicious. Well, thank you guys so much, Ev, as always. It's you and me, buddy. Um, And we will see you on the next episode of Stick a Fork in It and make sure you keep up with our nutrition education team. You can always find information on our social pages, Feeding Tampa Bay. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. You can learn more about Feeding Tampa Bay and how to join the movement at feedingtampabay.org. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok at Beating Tampa Bay. <laughs>